Thank you for coming to my talk. It's always uh, a treat to be able to do this. I've had the opportunity to do a lot of really cool things in my career and with bots, but the one thing that gave me more satisfaction than anything else I've ever done is the time I wrote a botnet that purchased millions of dollars worth of cars and defeated the Russian hackers. So let's have some fun with this, all right? I'm gonna tell you a story that involves hacking. It involves cars, I like cars. It involves Russian hackers, which is pretty cool. And more than anything else, it involves screwing with the system. Thank you, thank you. Or as I like to tell my mother, creating competitive advantages for clients. <laughs> That's important. It's easier to get a loan that way, too. So I've been writing bots for, since about 95. Uh, started out doing remote medicine bots, if you can believe that. I've been involved with privacy, fraud detection, private investigations. I've done work for foreign governments. And I've got a fair amount of my business that is with automotive clients. Uh, what makes me a little bit different than, I mean, a lot of people write bots. What makes me a little different is I actually talk about it. Um, unfortunately, the only projects I get to talk about are things that are in-house projects that I've been doing. It's really rare that I get a chance to talk about a specific project that I've done for a client. But I got permission to talk about this one. And it came about largely because when my last book was done, um, this one, uh, through No Starch Press, by the way, uh, they approached No Starch, a uh, Linux magazine, and they said, you know, can Mike write an article for us? And I really didn't have anything ready to write for them. So I approached this old client and I said, you know, enough time has passed, it's been like six years, let me write about this for a change. And they agreed to let me do this. Uh, but that's really key, because when you've got a piece of technology that provides a competitive advantage, or allows you to screw with the system strategically, you don't want to tell people about it, right? Because that's your, it's a trade secret, really. So if you want to get a little bit different view of this project, uh, if you can pick up one of the old copies of Linux Magazine, uh, I write about it in a little bit different way than the way I'm presenting it here tonight. Okay, what are you gonna learn? You're gonna learn what makes a good bot project. I'm gonna to have to give you a little bit of insight in how retail automotive works in order for this whole thing to make sense. You're gonna get an awareness of commercial bots and botnets and they actually do exist. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about if I were to do this again today, how would I do this differently? Because keep in mind this happened like six, seven years ago. So what makes a good bot project? The very first thing you need to know is that you cannot be afraid to do something different, okay? If your company has an internet strategy, assuming it has an internet strategy, that just involves browsers and things you can do with a browser, you're really missing out. Because you got the whole big wide internet available to you, and everybody uses the same tool, the browser, right, to access it. And if you expand your scope a little bit, and do things outside of the way browsers work, or do things outside of the way websites are presented to you, you can create a lot of um, really cool things. Okay, don't assume, just, just to raise a hand, how many people here have written a screen scraper? Okay, cool, how many people have written a spider? Wow, cool, cool. Well just, if you've got a client, make sure they realize that just because you know how to scrape screens, you can write a spider, it doesn't mean you can make a copy of the internet, okay? And you'd be surprised, I get people approaching me all the time with ideas for projects. A lot of them basically wanna create a copy of the internet. So if your project requires both batch processing and real-time results, you've got a problem. Or if you've got a project that requires just ridiculous scaling, you've got a problem. Because unless you've got one of these, your project's gonna fail. You know, you're not gonna replicate Google unless you've got one of these. And then I, I tell clients after I say, you know, you really can't do this, it's like, why not? And I'll say, well, because Google spends about a million dollars a day on electricity, that's why. 
That's why your project's gonna fail. Um, realize that you don't own, I refer to targets as the, the, the subject server. Don't assume that you own that server, okay? Uh, for example, I had a, a potential client approach me a few years ago and he wanted to monitor prices on Amazon about a hundred thousand for about a hundred thousand items. And I thought that sounds really like a, a useful thing to do. Uh, this guy was a big time Amazon seller until I found out that he wanted to do this every five seconds. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not going to work. It's not going to work for lots of reasons. Uh, if you did something like this, Amazon would actually have to build additional infrastructure to support your, your project and you'd end up in court with what they call a trespass to chattels suit and you want to avoid that. It's very illegal. Okay, number four, and this is maybe the most important thing. You have to have a realistic profit model. You notice I'm saying profit model and not business model. Why do I say that? This is why. Okay? And if I'm showing my age here a little bit, you can look at these. MySpace actually made the list twice. I think that's pretty impressive. <laughs> that's, that's staying power. So why is it important that you have a realistic profit model? You know, why is it that when people approach me and they want to do something that could just as easily be done on eBay, for example? It, this is important because the developer has to get paid, okay? That's very important. Okay, about automotive retailing. Just a little bit here. Without this, the project doesn't make sense. New car sales are not as profitable as people think they are, even if you combine service with that, because it's incredibly capital intensive and um, it's super, super competitive. But you need to have new car sales so you've got credibility if you want to sell used cars. This is particularly true if you want to sell high-end used cars. Nobody wants to go to the corner lot for that kind of stuff. The thing that I learned, and I didn't realize, I, I just assumed that all the used cars on a car lot were all trade-ins. Well, that's not the case, and it, it can't be the case, because you can't grow a business if you're going to do that, right? Um, and it's really limiting. Car dealerships spend tons of money acquiring good used cars to put on the car lot. And it's kind of bizarre the way it works, because you walk into a car lot, and you know what the price should be for a particular car because it's very well documented, right? You can go to Kelly Blue Book or any place. So dealers don't have a lot of space to, to, to work on the, on, the, on the price, the final retail price. But down on the wholesale side, that's where the profits and that's where the margins are made. If you're good at buying things for a great price, that's how you make money with used cars. And that's what this project is about. So. A car dealer came to me, he had this great opportunity, he found this wonderful website. Um, it was part of the, the national franchise. They were getting in uh, used rental cars, two years old, 12 to 16,000 miles, perfect cars that you'd wanna have on your lot, okay, well maintained. Unfortunately, there was a lot of competition for these cars because all the people in that dealership chain wanted the same cars and the website was horrible and made it almost impossible to buy the cars. So there's a lot of frustration. This is kind of the way it worked. There would be maybe two to 300 cars presented every day and the cars would have little display ads like this that gave a little bit of a description and there was an inactive buy now button, okay? And at exactly sale time, that button would appear. Okay, but the problem with this was it wasn't using Ajax or anything. You had to physically sit and refresh the browser constantly to get that button to appear. Well, this led to another problem in that there was incredible server lag. My client, and I think he was probably pretty typical of all of them in this, in this chain, he would grab every person he could find, people out of parts, out of, you know, off the sales floor, administrative assistance, he'd set them all in front of computers, and each one of them was assigned maybe about six cars, 
So they'd have six browser windows open and they're all sitting there frantically hitting the refresh button constantly. So if you think about this, okay, so this would have been roughly the equivalent of 36 users for this one dealership. I don't know, maybe there were 750 dealers that were doing this. So that was almost 30,000 simultaneous downloads that were happening at sale time. And what made this worse, I mean, servers should be able to handle that, right? But I think there was some inefficiency with the um, database possibly, some bad queries were being made. And this caused a ridiculous peak in server lag time right at the point where you don't want to have it. And it would take, you know, it wouldn't be unusual for it to take 15 or 30 seconds for the screen to refresh at sale time. Uh, sometimes it would just time out. So this was a real problem. The other problem is that out of these, say, 200 cars that were up for sale every day, there were maybe five that every single dealership in the country wanted. Either because they were the right color, probably because they were a, a really great price, um, or for whatever reason, I don't know. But every dealership would want these five cars. So you had a lot of competition for the same cars. Plus server lag, bad web design, you had to involve a lot of people to do this. So this particular client, I had written a number of bots for him in the past, and he gave me a call and said, can you help me out, Mike? I said, well, let's take a look. So the problems were, his, it, the system was way too manual to begin with. So the way this would work, he would have to manually go and select the cars that he wanted to buy. He'd have to distribute the VIN numbers to the various people. He'd have to call people in off of their normal duties that they would be doing. They'd be dedicating probably a good 15 to 20 minutes hitting the refresh button every day. Um, so that wasn't good. Plus the buy button took way too long to appear because of the server lag. So we came up with, we ended up with two solutions. One of them because it worked, the second one because we had competition. Uh, so let's look at phase one first here. And again, this is not like classic bot design. Uh, and keep in mind, this was done like six years ago. So I don't develop like this anymore. Okay, so here's what I did. I came up with a web interface for my client. And if you look here, this is basically just four HTML frames that were independent from each other. And, um, you know, they could just go to a URL, pull this up. And by the way, I say botnet, but this was all done on computers that we controlled. Well, not controlled, we owned. Okay, there's a difference, right? Um, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> all of the bots that I write, they're all commercial bots. We own all the hardware, okay? I just want to let you guys know that. So instead of um, hauling in all these people to hit the refresh button constantly while they should be doing something else, my client was able to pull up something like this and quite frequently he would have two or three computers set up with this in the browser and he would just select what cars he wanted. Uh, the first step was to log on. Um, they had several accounts for the, it was a closed sale basically. And they had several accounts they could use so the first thing they would do is they would pick which account they wanted to use for this particular bot. And the next step was you would pick the, the VIN number of the car you wanted and it would go ahead and it would validate that that was an actual car for sale. That's important because anytime you're writing a bot, you don't want to do something that could not possibly be done by a human. And if there's a car that says is, is not available for sale, you don't want to try to buy that because <laughs> some system admin somewhere is going to say, how did they do that? What was that IP address? Boy, they're generating a lot of traffic, really good traffic. Um, so it's important to validate stuff like that. So as soon as the VIN was validated, a little start button would appear. So instead of being, you know, right on time when the sale was, you could do this hours in advance, hit the start button, and then it would start to count down. Now the way it would do this is uh, it was basically synchronizing its clock with the server clock of the, of the sales server. And this was really simple stuff. In the meta refresh, in the HTML meta refresh, it would just start refreshing every so often. And it would get, you know, as the sale got closer and closer, 
it would refresh more often until right at the end, it was like right lockstep with the server clock. And as soon as it timed out, it would go ahead and it would attempt to purchase the car. Now this shows just one bot client, and basically the bot clients acted as triggers for the server that actually made the purchase. Um, and there may have been 16 to 30 of these bots running, or triggering the server. Um, sometimes we'd miss one, but more often, the sale was successful. And uh, we would send an email confirmation to my client saying, you bought this car. And we would also arrange for financing for him. And while we were at it, we'd made sure that the car actually was shipped correctly back to his dealership. So the bot provided a lot of utility in that regard. So how successful were we? Well, before, he wasn't getting anything. And this was really frustrating for him because these were cars he really wanted and he knew he could make a profit on them given the price they were selling for. After, we were getting probably about 95 to 97% of the cars he was trying to buy. So the difference was phenomenal. Um, it was so much fun because even after I was done developing this, I would get a call every day from my client 15 to 20 minutes after the sale and he would say, Mike, we bought five out of six today. We got seven out of seven. We got nine out of 12. And I'm like, settle down, don't, don't get greedy here because <laughs> you know, don't, don't kill the golden goose. So why were we successful at this? Well, the main problem with the old one is that people had to wait for that stupid refresh button or that, that buy it now button to happen. And there was so much problem, so much server lag that um, that was the problem. And usually the, whoever got the buy button first was the person that bought the car. So basically what we did is we got rid of the buy button. We just got rid of it. And we replaced it with a timer that was automated so you didn't need that person hitting refresh all the time. And it would just know what time to buy the car and it would go ahead and buy it. The, this type of um, a, a bot is, is typically called a sniper. You've ever heard that term before? Um, and I remember back in the day when I was doing this, we were testing, and I, I was gonna write him an email that said something to the effect of, uh, uh, I've got six snipers waiting to hit cars at noon. Um, ho hopefully we'll make some hits today, or we'll have some kills or something like that. And I was just about ready to send that email, and I started thinking about carnivore, you know, and some of the stuff that was happening back then, and I thought, no, I'll just give him a call. Today, I would never send an email like that. <laughs> never. I'm not even sure I'd make a phone call. So yeah, watch your language. Okay, so everything worked great for about six months, and then all of a sudden, things weren't as rosy anymore. We started not, you know, Mark would call, excuse me, uh, the client would call, and um, he would say, um, you know, we only got two out of seven today. Some, something's wrong. And he did some research, and he discovered through his connections, he's got lots of connections, that there was a group of Russian hackers that were hired to write a competing bot, and they were someplace out in New Jersey, or the dealership was out in New Jersey or something. Excuse me? Who what? Jan Nimnoga Ponimayo. I don't know, no comprendo. Um, so competition is good, right? And that leads to innovation. That was kind of thinking, yeah, let's, this is gonna be fun now. We've got an arms race going on here. So here's part two of the solution. Um, what I did differently is while I was synchronizing clocks with the sales server, I started looking at lag time. And I got to the point where I got really good at estimating how much lag time there would be at the sale time. So in other words, what I was essentially doing is I was estimating how many users were on the system. And with that information, I would not set one attempt to buy the car, but for each bot, I would launch maybe between, I forget what the real number was, because I haven't looked at the code for ages, but I probably launched between five and seven attempts to buy the car 
and based on the amount of lag time that I was going to anticipate at the sale time, I would launch them just a little bit before, um, incrementally before the sale time. And this was real successful. Um, so now there would be a number of bots and each one of those basically had a warhead that launched multiple attempts to buy the cars. And so our, our success rate prior to making this fix during the competition was about, he's getting about 50% after we were back right on the money, we were getting every car we wanted. And it stayed that way through the duration of this program. So how successful was the bot? These are all guesses, okay, because I don't have any hard facts here. But I, I know it was in operation for about 40 weeks and they were buying roughly five cars a day. So there's about 800 cars, I'm gonna estimate, were purchased with this. Uh, if you figure the average wholesale cost of the cars they were purchasing was probably around $16,000. So in a 40 week period, this bot purchased almost $13 million worth of cars. Um, and that has a huge impact on a small dealer like this one. So this is a great example of not accepting the web as it is, not using browsers where everybody else would, and doing something different, and not being afraid to uh, step outside of the box a little bit. So what would I do differently today if I was gonna do this? Um, first, there were things that were done pretty well back then, and things that I still do today. I really like having very lightweight clients. The lighter, the better. Um, everything is easily updated because it was all online and it was easily distributed. I could make changes on the server. It would get distributed everywhere because basically these were just, these, these bot clients were essentially just web pages with some JavaScript and stuff going on. One of the things I really definitely would do if I were to do this over is I would build in some analytics and collect metrics. So I would really want to know exactly what our success rate was. I would want to know exactly how much these cars were purchased for. It would be really great to also know how much they were sold for, so it could actually show value. Uh, that's something I really wish I had done. The other thing I think that would have been nice if I were to do this over again is build in some, some process that actually assists in the selection of, of which vehicles you want to purchase. So in other words, maybe what I would have done is I would have also had my bot look at Kelly Blue Book and figure out what the good wholesale prices are for cars and see, look for discrepancies, locate the ones that are, that are underpriced. That would have been a really good thing to do. The other thing that occurred to me um, actually within the last week, is probably the only thing I really needed to do here is make that buy it now button happen, right? And I could have done that simply by making the server act kind of like a proxy. So as the HTML is coming in with the grayed out button, I could have just replaced it with a real button and sent it off to the, the browser, right? That probably would have worked. The problem there is that conceivably you could have bought cars before the purchase time. And that may have been allowed, but that's something you don't want to do for the same reason you don't want to buy cars that don't exist. Uh, you, don't want to, you don't want to show your hand. The website, the target, was a very traditional website. It used HTML forms, which were really easy for me to emulate or submit using just PHP and curl. Today, you don't find that so often. You find a lot of um, JavaScript. You find a lot of Ajax. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, JavaScript uh, validation of form data before it's submitted. It makes it a lot harder to do this kind of thing today. So today, the kind of approach that I take now is I end up with a task queue, which is basically a table in a database that keeps track of what needs to be done. And there's a web interface into that. So in this particular case, my client would essentially be loading a task queue. And that task queue would be fed to individual computers, which I refer to as harvesters. And they can exist anywhere. They can be in the cloud, they can be in a, 
uh, you know, in a closet, they can be in your office, uh, they can be anywhere. And what I have them do now, since there's so much more complexity in websites and so much more use of um, um, client-side scripting, I do a lot of stuff in iMacros. Any, anybody here use iMacros? It is the most amazing tool. It's, it's just an add-on for your browser that essentially lets you create a macro for your browser that you can just play over and over again. Um, and what I do now is the harvesters will dynamically create that macro so you can get them to do some very specific things. Once I learned how to do that, there was not a single website on the planet I could not manipulate. It was like the gods handing me fire. It's like, here, here Mike, you've been a good boy. So that's what I do now. And uh, so I, I actually communicate through Firefox. So it's very easy for me to emulate human activity now with bots. So I would have them hit the sales server. The difficulty there would be to get the timing down correctly, but I think that could have been done. And then the harvesters, after they do their thing with the, the sales server, the target server, they report back to the bot server and the, the queue is updated and that's how you can tell what the results were of what you did. If you're interested in how that kind of stuff works, go on YouTube and look up my DEF CON 17 talk because that's all about manipulating iMacros in that way to, uh, to do um, um, screen scraper, screen scrapers for very difficult to scrape sites or difficult to automate kind of sites. So that's, that's my talk. Um, thanks for all of you for coming. Thank you to the uh, Call for Paper goons. Thank you. Let me write about this for a change and they agreed to let me do this. Uh, but that's really key, because when you've got a piece of technology that provides a competitive advantage or allows you to screw with the system strategically, you don't want to tell people about it, right? Because that's your, it's a trade secret, really. So if you want to get a little bit different view of this project, uh, if you can pick up one of the old copies of Linux Magazine, uh, I write about it in a little bit different way than the way I'm presenting it here tonight. Okay, what are you gonna learn? You're gonna learn what makes a good bot project. I'm gonna have to give you a little bit of insight in how retail automotive works in order for this whole thing to make sense. You're gonna get an awareness of commercial bots and botnets and they actually do exist. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about if I were to do this again today, how would I do this differently? Because keep in mind this happened like six, seven years ago. Thank you for coming to my talk. It's always a, a treat to be able to do this. I've had the opportunity to do a lot of really cool things in my career and with bots, but the one thing that gave me more satisfaction than anything else I've ever done is the time I wrote a botnet that purchased millions of dollars worth of cars and defeated the Russian hackers. So let's have some fun with this, all right? I'm gonna tell you a story that involves hacking. It involves cars, I like cars. It involves Russian hackers, which is pretty cool. And more than anything else, it involves screwing with the system. Thank you, thank you. Or as I like to tell my mother, creating competitive advantages for clients. <laughs> That's important, it's easier to get a loan that way too. So I've been writing bots for, since about 95. Uh, started out doing remote medicine bots, if you can believe that. I've been involved with privacy, fraud detection, private investigations, I've done work for foreign governments. And I've got a fair amount of my business that is with automotive clients. Uh, what makes me a little bit different than, I mean a lot of people write bots. What makes me a little different is I actually talk about it. Um, unfortunately, the only projects I get to talk about are things that are in-house projects that I've been doing. It's really rare that I get a chance to talk about a specific project that I've done for a client. But I got permission to talk about this one. And it came about largely because when my last book was done, um, this one, uh, through No Starch Press, by the way, 
uh, they approached No Starch, a Linux magazine, and they said, you know, can Mike write an article for us? And I really didn't have anything ready to write for them. So I approached this old client and I said, you know, enough time has passed, it's been like six years. So what makes a good bot project? The very first thing you need to know is that you cannot be afraid to do something different, okay? If your company has an internet strategy, assuming it has an internet strategy, that just involves browsers and things you can do with a browser, you're really missing out. Because you got the whole big wide internet available to you. And everybody uses the same tool, the browser, right, to access it. And if you expand your scope a little bit and do things outside of the way browsers work, or do things outside of the way websites are presented to you, you can create a lot of um, really cool things. Okay, don't assume, just, just to raise a hand, how many people here have written a screen scraper? Okay, cool. How many people have written a spider? Wow, cool, cool. Well, just, if you've got a client, make sure they realize that just because you know how to scrape screens, you can write a spider, it doesn't mean you can make a copy of the internet, okay? <laughs> and you'd be surprised, I get people approaching me all the time with ideas for projects. A lot of them basically want to create a copy of the internet. So if your project requires both batch processing and real-time results, you've got a problem. Or if you've got a project that requires just ridiculous scaling, you've got a problem. Because unless you've got one of these, your project's gonna fail. You know, you're not gonna replicate Google unless you've got one of these. And then I, I tell clients after I say, you know, you really can't do this, it's like, why not? And I'll say, well, because Google spends about a million dollars a day on electricity, that's why. That's why your project's gonna fail. Um, realize that you don't own, I refer to targets as the, the, the subject server. Don't assume that you own that server, okay? Uh, for example, I had a, a potential client approach me a few years ago and he wanted to monitor prices.